It's some of what I consider to be the most important segments of the week because we're dealing with something that's going to affect us and our children and quite possibly our children's children for the future of the state of Alaska. Sometimes I feel like Brad and I are just barking at the wind, but uh, we've got to do it because it's something important. Brad Keithley joins me this morning to discuss the special, 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 special session and more. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. Do you have the blood pressure meds close, or are you going to I should. Have to... I should be cracked. I may have to mug an old lady to get her blood pressure meds at this point. I'm just, uh, I, you know, this is this is pretty insane, Brad. And I and I know that you. We have some things that you want to talk about. You had a little bit of a plan, but again, <clears throat> I'm a little disconcerted by Pete Kelly's commentary from K- to KTVA yesterday about this, where all of a sudden. What has become a what was a bright line in the sand has now become an amorphous butt. We've got to discuss it and come together on the numbers. Yeah, it's um, the Senate Republicans have been sliding toward this uh, for two sessions, three sessions now. Well, actually, it goes back to 2012. In, in, in 2012, the Senate Republicans replaced the the then bipartisan majority. Uh, on three planks. One was to deal with oil taxes, which were a mess at that point. Uh, the second was something I don't recall. But the third was to establish a sustainable budget. I remember Kathy Giesel. I remember other uh, candidates at the time getting up and saying, we must have a sustainable budget. We're spending this. Uh, we're spending our children's money. We're spending the state into an abyss. Uh, we have to get our budget under control. And that was on the heels of then an eight billion dollar uh, uh, budget that the that the governor had signed, then Governor Parnell had signed, the Senate and the House had passed, and they came in rocking that they were going to get this under control. Um, and I think the first year they got it from eight from seven point nine billion to seven point two billion, <laughs> and, right. and and you could see the you could see the writing on the wall then. Uh, it was you know the special interests. That had that had been involved in building the budget up, uh, building you know programs up, op- building the building the operating budget up, building the capital budget up, uh, started started digging in their heels even then, uh, and saying uh, you, you cut yes please cut but don't cut our program, and if when you looked around the Senate you saw senators from each sort of from each special interest right sort of digging in their heels. Kathy Giesel right. ultimately d- dug in her heels on, on oil tax credits. So it's, right. it's been a very difficult road all along. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think we're starting to see some of the true colors come out here, and it's very, very troubling to me that uh, this is kind of where we're at. But let's, let's start off where you wanted to start off and talk about <clears throat> what is happening, uh, the administration, uh, and specifically – Lieutenant Governor Byron Malott's uh, lament that we are just doing it wrong and nobody seems to care but them and uh, the legislature is doing nothing. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, so Malott Malott gave a speech to um, uh, AFM, which was a fairly rousing speech uh, by all uh, by all measures, by by those who were in attendance. And then he followed that up uh, or the administration followed that up by putting a portion of that speech in an op-ed uh, into the Dispatch News, and it's, and it's shown up in the News Miner, and now it's shown up in the Juno Empire as well. And there's a there's a piece of that uh, speech and, and the op-ed I just find uh, amazingly eye-opening. Um, it says, and this is a quote, it says, state spending is so minimal that we are now in recession. <laughs> a close quote. Essentially, yeah. and, and I've run across this in the administration before, uh, essentially their view is that the state is in a recession uh, because state spending has been cut. That state right. spending is what dr- what drives this state's economy, and if you cut state spending, then, then you've thrown the state into a recession. And, and that's just so, – so if you think that, and, and, and just sort of play this out, if you think that, then the solution is to rush money into state spending to pull the state out of the recession. If you think that the cause of the recession is the reduction in state spending, then the solution to the recession is to move money into state government 
to get state spending back up, state get spending, uh, state government spending back up, uh, and 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 solve the recession. That's 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 what this administration thinks, and and I've and I've seldom seen it so clearly stated as in the lot speech and as as in this piece. It's just wrong from the standpoint of economics. That's just wrong. And if they have the premise wrong, they have the solution wrong. Uh, the, the, what's really caused this recession, I mean, you go out and talk to 10 people on the street. Ten of them are going to get this answer right. What caused the recession? What caused the recession was the drop in oil prices uh, and, and the drop that we've suffered over the last couple of decades uh, in oil production. Uh, and 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 when oil prices on that low on that lower production figure, when oil prices dropped, it it took steam out of the private economy, and started re- resulting in layoffs and reductions in spending by the oil companies. That's what started the recession. A consequence of that was a reduction also in oil's contributions to state government, and a consequence of that was a reduction in state spending. But that's not what caused the recession. What's caused the recession is the drop uh, in oil prices, originally the drop in oil prices and the, and the drop in production. So the solution to the recession is not uh, to, to rush money into, into state government. The solution to the recession is to find other ways to, to hold the line on the private economy. Uh, and uh, and and if you can find ways to increase oil production, as as we did with SB 21, uh, then to to, to reinflate uh, oil production, and 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 the solution to reinflating the private economy are things like holding the line, keeping the permanent fund dividend in place. As ICER has said, that cutting the dividend has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy of all the new revenue provisions. It has it has by far the worst impact on Alaska families. If you if you want to if you want to deal with the recession, you keep the PFD in place. But what government has done, what what what, what Malas speech real, uh, focuses on is if you think the recession is due to 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 a cut in government spending, then you do things like you cut the PFD and you move that over to government so government can spend it instead of individual Alaskans. We've made the we've made the recession worse. Government has made the recession worse by the steps it's taken, and the lot speech helps you focus on the fact that we're we're going down this wrong path because government doesn't under the administration doesn't understand what caused the recession in the first place. Right. Well, I'll tell you, I read his piece, and I, and and when I read a piece, I I highlight, I go through and I highlight certain areas. And that was the one thing that just leapt out at me. State spending is so minimal that we are now in a recession. Here's somebody who obviously doesn't understand, A, the history of the finances of the state of Alaska, because we were in a recession before we started to cut state spending, and and, and does not understand the, the macroeconomics of everything that goes on in here. The state cannot... I mean, not at a sustainable level. It cannot do that. And it, again, it just doesn't understand the kind of whole free market concept here. And as you said, when the premise is wrong, everything else beyond that is wrong. You can't you can't work from a flawed foundation. And that's where we're at. And it's yeah, just, it, it's it, astonishing. It it is, and it and it and it focuses. I mean, this is part of the problem with the Senate Republicans too. To go back to Pete Kelly. Part of the part of the problem is the people we have in Juneau, the representatives we have in Juneau, think government drives everything. They are not they have they are not representatives of Alaska to government, as as I think you know the the we we think of government being set up with representatives sent from the people to help run government. They they have turned into representatives of government. <laughs> To Alaskans and to tell Alaskans right. what needs to be done or to vote for things that need to keep government big, and and it's and 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 we've just we we've, we've got the shoe on the wrong foot or whatever the right analogy is, we're focusing on keeping government whole. We have a government now who's focusing on keeping government whole because looking again at Malat's piece, they think government drives the economy, and so they're doing whatever it takes, rushing whatever resources, whatever financial resources. They need into government to keep it big, uh, at the expense of the of the overall Alaska economy, and that's just we, we're we're just going in reverse. And the and the and the, the the more we keep going down this path, 
the more we keep talking about taking money out of the private economy through PFD cuts, as we've done, and now through through taxes, we're just making this situation worse. It's not government that drives the Alaska economy. It's the Alaska – it's the private sector in the Alaska economy that drives the Alaska economy. Government is a piece of that, but government is not the be-all and end-all. And if we think it is, we're just we're, – we're making this situation worse. Let's talk about the end game for a minute because I think Suzanne Downing uh, had a, uh, talked about this. We talked about it last week uh, during the program. I don't know if you and I talked about it, but I know that I discussed it. It seems to be coming more and more to the forefront that more and more what the governor is attempting to do here appears to be uh, a tax measure by any, by, at any price. That essentially doesn't matter how big or how small, he wants to get a tax measure in there. And what that appears to be in the long run is that it means that it means that what he's looking for is any tax measure, no matter how small, because then down the road, it appears that they'd be able to crank it up. And he's really turning up the urgency right now because there are signs on the horizon that Alaska's fiscal crisis could be reversing itself. And so he's, he's on a timeline here to get this done before – the crisis disappears. Am I am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I, it, the governor, uh, on several occasions, has said things exactly uh, exactly of that nature that that he's open to whatever new revenue quote new revenue measures uh, can pass the legislature, and 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 what they're trying to do. I mean, go back to Malat's piece. What they're trying to do is keep government big because they think. That, that the cuts in state spending are the cause of the recession, and so the cure to the recession is to keep government big, and the cure to future recessions is to keep government big. So it really doesn't ma- – if you, if you take that as your premise, it really doesn't matter what new revenue measures are adopted, cutting the PFD, taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, payroll taxes. It really doesn't matter what tax measure you adopt because – all it, all you're trying to do is feed government to keep government big to 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 cure in Malat's terms to cure the recession or to to avoid the next one. That's I mean, one tax is not like the other. I mean, if if we learned anything from the ICER analysis last year, and now I'm beginning to wonder if the administration did learn anything. But if we learned anything from the ICER analysis last year, is that different tax measures have different effects. They have different effects on the economy. They have different effects on Alaska families. They have different effects on poverty levels. They have different effects. Cutting the PFD has the largest, quote, largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy of any of the new revenue measures. Cutting the PFD is, quote, by far, close quote, close quote, the worst for Alaska families. Cutting the PFD likely increases poverty levels in Alaska by 2% of the population, 12 to 15,000 Alaskans are pushed below the poverty level as a result of a $1,000 PFD cut. Progressive income taxes have, a, have, have bad consequences. Sales taxes have bad consequences. Other forms of taxes have bad consequences. None of them rise to the level of the PFD cut in terms of the bad consequences, but that's the first lever they've pulled because that's the lever they could get Uh, the Senate and the House to agree to most quickly. They're not paying attention. This administration is not paying it, and and the legislature's not paying attention to what they're doing to the overall Alaska economy. The only motivation is to rush money to government to keep government big. And that that's just going to send us that that's as you put it at the at the outset that not only affects this generation of Alaskans, it affects our children and it affects our children's children. We are changing the structure of Alaska uh, by by what new revenue measures we're using. 90 seconds here, Brad. Um, there is good news on the horizon. Just give us a quick thumbnail of some of the stuff that we're going to be seeing that could be reversing this uh, this uh, this fiscal crisis. We have uh, – we'll talk about this in the next, sec- next segment, but we see – uh, a lot. We're seeing a lot of oil and gas activity out there, not driven by the oil and gas tax credits, by the way, but we're seeing a lot of new oil and gas uh, uh, activity out there. Conoco's drilling some new wells we'll talk about in the next segment that I think are hugely important. Uh, we're, be- we're beginning to see an uptick, a stabilization and an uptick in oil and gas activity. That's going to have very good knock-on consequences uh, to not only the oil and gas sector, but the rest of the economy going forward. 
All right, Brad Keithley is our guest right here on your home for Common Sense Radio, The Michael Duke Show. Uh, for those of you who've been trying to reach the program and want to find out where the stream is, you can go to MichaelDukeShow.com. And just click on the KBYR link there, and you will find the link to the stream where you can listen to Brad and the entirety of the show live on your mobile device or on your desktop. Go out there and check it out. And of course, we always put the uh, we always put the uh, uh, podcasts up later in the program or later in the day as well of the whole program. Brad, before we went to break, we were talking about some good stuff that was coming in, including new uh, oil discoveries and potential for new production and maybe this crisis is only a short-term crisis and we should stop treating it like if we don't fix it now nothing else is going to happen yeah there's 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 a couple of things to be said about that one uh is it it, it will continue to be a crisis if we don't get spending under control. I mean, what, one of the things we have to do is we have to get spending down to long-term sustainable, sustainable levels. Sustainable levels are what we can what we can anticipate over time, projected over time from oil revenues, plus implementing Hammond 5050. What we can anticipate over time from the other 50 percent of the permanent fund earnings, which Governor Hammond. Uh, has envisioned from the outset as being used to help supplement government revenue when oil was no longer sufficient to, to fund government. We have to get spending down to long-term sustainable levels, or else nothing is going to is going to to get us out of this hole. But if you if you if you think about get, being able to get spending down to long-term sustainable levels, there are things on the horizon that are very positive in terms of what we're seeing from oil production. Not only has oil production gone up the last two years um, uh, in terms of absolute production, we're now producing more oil, uh, more oils coming through the pipeline than was occurring two years ago. That's a positive response, I think, to, and others think, to SB21. That's a positive sign. Uh, we are, we are uh, it, it, Gradually building up additional additional production from existing sources, uh, but there's some great news out there in terms of what's going on in the exploration uh, activities. P uh, listeners, most listeners know, but there are really three phases in uh, in oil development: exploration, production, and development. You explore for oil, you find the oil, then you put it on production, uh, then you then you put fields that you find through exploration on production, and then you develop. Uh, those fields as you go along, as we've done with with Prudo over the over the last four decades, Conoco's out there in the field uh, doing exploration, the front end of oil development in a way they haven't done uh, in in a long time. There's a article from earlier this month that Alex DeMarbin did in the Alaska Dispatch Dispatch News that has the headline: Conoco Phillips Alaska plans largest exploration season. In 15 years, Conoco's out there uh, announced that they're going out there. They've been funded to go out with five exploration wells uh, this year in new areas that uh, that have previously not uh, been under production. Areas where they think uh, they have they have oil. Some of these areas uh, are are toward uh, the the new uh, Nanukshuk play that. Uh, uh, Repsol and Armstrong are developing uh, down uh, on the east side of the North Slope, uh, sort of south of Kaparik. Uh, and, and Conoco, in response, I think, to that, to seeing that new development down there and seeing uh, uh, the opportunities that they've developed in Willow and other areas as they've gone further east from their existing development, they're seeing opportunities and, and, and putting these five exploration wells in the field that's that it, it is hard to hard to overstate uh, how good a sign that is that Conoco is is taking resources that they otherwise corporate resources that otherwise might be spent developing uh, additional shale wells uh, down the lower 48 uh, they're bringing these resources up to Alaska financial resources uh, and 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 talent up to Alaska to identify and drill these additional wells. Huge, huge uh, 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 positive from the standpoint of the state's oil and gas uh, uh, industry. So we've, we've been gaining on production over the last two years, and now we're seeing uh, additional exploration going on uh, by one of the established uh, majors 
uh, stepping out there and putting resources uh, in the field to to identify additional resource additional oil. And that's the I mean these are the good news. And again, uh, it just puts into perspective the fact that what we see the governor and the legislature trying to do is trying to continue to push hard on this whole crisis issue and hoping that they can get something in there that will bolster the government economy uh, before the people wise up and people start to figure out that this that this recession that this recessionary crisis and the, and that this fiscal crisis that the government is suffering is really more short term and again it goes back to that we've been talking about running back and forth across the deck of the ship rocking one way and then the other instead of just being a little more thoughtful and taking our time and uh, living within our means when we have lots of money and 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 you know using our savings wisely when we don't have a lot of money yeah, basically, basically this debate, <clears throat> Michael, and, and, and going back to the first segment, uh, particularly when you go back in and look at Malat's speech, uh, basically this ar- argument is boiling down to big government versus smaller government. What the administration is trying to do <clears> – <throat> excuse me – what the administration is trying to do in the midst of this fiscal crisis is lock in uh, a revenue stream that will support big government, big Alaska government going forward. Uh, and and keep Alaska government at a size that, if you're to believe what Malat said, is necessary to ward off to to, to avoid continued recession and to ward off future recession. And and so during this fiscal crisis, they're trying to go in, develop, lock in additional resources, and and that will keep government growing. That will send us back to high government spending. Uh, if we uh, have success, if Conoco and others have success in de- developing additional oil resources, so yeah, if you believe in small, if you believe that government can be constrained and and can be held to sustainable levels, we have good news on the horizon uh, from the stamp from the standpoint of Repsol and Armstrong's development, from what Conoco Phillips is doing, from the success we've had, uh, BP's had in holding up uh, uh, Prudhoe production. We have we have a a growing future uh, uh, on the horizon, but if you believe, but that's if you believe that we can constrain the size of government. If you believe that, like like Malat evidently does, that we need to grow government uh, even further, uh, then no, this is going to fuel some additional growth. The success on the oil side is going to fuel some additional growth, but but they believe they need to take more out of the economy. Uh, uh, through taxes and through PFD cuts to uh, to fund increased government spending. Right. And, of course, with the good, there's always uh, also some bad to balance that out, and we had plenty of that at this last meeting of the uh, Gasline Development Corp and the shenanigans that they seem to be going through right now. Yeah, they uh, the, the LNG plan, uh, the, L- the uh, LNG project that the states uh, embarked on, uh, that it took on entirely by itself 18 months ago uh, continues spending money. They continue making an effort. There was a hearing last week uh, before uh, the resources Co- Finance and Resources Committee to hear an update from the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation on where they are. Um, and and basically the report what and this was the first report since they had gone through the open season, the August open season. Uh, which the Gas Line Development Corporation held in order to gauge interest uh, in the project. They got no commitments, uh, basically, out of the open season other than than those they made to themselves. What happened was the producers, the big three producers, who who were asked either to, to commit to shipping gas, which would help under, underpin the, the state's project, or to sell gas to the state, which the state would then use to ship, uh, the producers, all three major producers, chose to sell gas to the state as their option, which means the only shipper uh, on the on the that made any commitments to the uh, AGDC in the in the open season was the state itself, the state that that was going to buy the portion of the state that was going to buy the gas from the producers uh, was made a commitment to ship on the gas itself. That's sort of you know taking money from one hand and and putting it in the other and saying oh we have success right, as as you run it in circles. Um, that's, that wasn't a very that, – that was not a successful open season. It was a very disappointing uh, outturn out of the open season. At the hearing, uh, the AGDC said, said that they were still on track, thought they were making a lot of progress in developing markets, 
but they have no markets. They have no customers uh, other than themselves yet to report. There was, there is one positive that came out of the out of the out of the session if the government holds to it, and that is they said they're on a they view themselves as being on a deadline of coming up with a customer uh, for the gas line customer or customers for the gas line by the end of the year, and that uh, uh, to in a sense they will recognize that this project is not remaining viable if they don't come up with firm customers by the end of the year. So at least we have a date. Um, uh, another date. Frankly, right. the governor a year a year ago had said we were we, he was going to view it by September 1st. If we didn't have customers by September 1st, he was going to be concerned. Now that date is pushed to uh, uh, the end of the year, but at least we have a date we're looking toward. Well, and and again, I. Uh, I mean, will they? Re- we really, really mean it this time. We really mean that if it's by December, we'll really pull the plug. But you know, we really mean it this time, which just again blows my mind. Final thoughts here as we get ready to wrap up. Uh, kind of a here we go again thing. We've got this first day of the special session. They totally derailed the special session so far. Uh, not on schedule. Had to cancel uh, hearings and everything else because they were talking in caucus, doing all this stuff amongst themselves with really no concern is what it appears to be for other Alaskans. But that's not unusual since the same group of folks decided to hold their own meetings on oil and gas taxes and discussions and then made the meetings public, and I'm using air quotes around that, because there was really no way for the public to participate. Yeah, it's the, the, from an oil and gas perspective, the, 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 the key thing that's going on this special session and will continue to go on uh, toward the next uh, regular session is a working group that got put together, uh, that got created at the end of last special session. Yeah, I guess it was a special session. At the end of last special session, so <laughs> to, re, to relook. It's we hard can't to keep track. <laughs> to, to relook at uh, oil and, the oil and gas tax situation it, as, as, part of, uh, as part of terminating the oil and gas credit program going forward, uh, there was an agreement between the Senate and the House that would establish a working group involving members of both Senate and the House to relook at oil and gas taxes. They have gone out and they've hired consultants to do that, and now the working group uh, has been formed and they've started meeting. Uh, the first set of meetings are during are during this special session. All of that is geared toward uh, coming up with a proposal in the next legislative session, which would be next spring, uh, to look at uh, next January to look at. Uh, oil and gas taxes again. Uh, it's being driven by the by the House side, by uh, House Resource Co-chairs uh, Garen Tarr and Andy Josephson, but the Senate is participating in it. It was part of the compromise to get the oil and gas tax credit program uh, terminated without an increase, a simultaneous increase in oil and gas taxes at that time, and it's going to be an ongoing effort. Uh, starting in this special session, leading up to the next uh, next regular session, that's 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 sort of the hidden thing that's going on right now. You, you alluded to a, an article in uh, uh, in in APRN, the Alaska Public Radio Network, that that tried to follow what was going on with the first meeting of this working group. Couldn't get it held. It was held on a state holiday, Alaska Day. They couldn't get access uh, to what was going on. Um, and hopefully the, the, the subsequent meetings will be more transparent. But that's that from an oil and gas standpoint, that's really the big thing that's going to be going on here through the end of the year, what that group is going to be focusing on in terms of changes to oil and gas tax taxes. Continuing discussions now, uh, just finished up with Brad Keithley, and now we're joined by Representative Sharice.